Hey, Lawrence Mechanic here from Precision Test Prep. I just wanna go over my method for doing reading comprehension passages. I know for the most part, we're always told, read the passage and answer the questions. But what if there's a better way? What if there's a way in which we can increase the amount of time we spend thinking about the questions and decrease the amount of time we spend reading? That sounds like a good plan, right? Well, if you follow what I do right here, you'll be on your way. This is part of the uh, PSAT, it's PSAT number one, all right? So in the actual SAT, there's 65 minutes and 52 questions. So just a few more questions there. Either way, on average, you get about 12 to 13 minutes per passage. That means that you have a lot of time to move through, but rather than reading this and spending maybe five to six minutes and then only having seven minutes left to answer all, all the questions. What if we flipped it and focused on the questions and allowed ourselves about a minute and 15 seconds on average per question? I'd rather do that way only because I know how effective this method is. All right, so let me show you how it works. Start over here. Jane Austen's Emma originally published in 1815. Ugh, 1815, all right, so what does that mean? That means we really have to get into this and use our voice, okay? The rules themselves still work. The order of operations, so to speak, still is the same, but we have to use more voice and more tone in order to make this work. So here we go. I'm going to head down to the first question. I can't answer it though, because it says the main purpose of the passage is to. So I'm going to skip that one and just come back to it after once I read, I can do that. Now, sometimes there are questions that just start off directly. Uh, that is just luck of the draw. But for the most part, there's a main purpose, main idea, you know, larger context picture uh, type questions, okay? So let's go over here, uh, one to 14. Okay, you'll notice I immediately, I'm, I'm just looking for line numbers. That's the number one thing I'm doing. And it literally says summarizes the first two paragraphs, okay? So when I read this question, I'm trying to omit the extra wording. Which choice best summarizes the first two paragraphs of the passage? How about which choice summarizes the first two paragraphs of the passage? That's a lot easier. The word best is a trick word. It means that all options can potentially be correct. And that's not true. There has to be three wrong and there must be one right every time, okay? So let's go over here. All right, so I bracket that out. Emma Woodhouse, handsome, clever, and rich, with a comfortable home and happy disposition, seemed to unite some of the best blessings of existence and had lived nearly 21 years in the world with very little to distress or vex her. She was the youngest of the two daughters of a most affectionate, indulgent father and had, in consequence of her sister's marriage, been mistress of his house from a very early period. Her mother had died too long ago for her to have more than an indistinct remembrance of her caresses and her place had been supplied by an excellent woman as governess who had fallen little short of a mother in affection. Now there are, there's a lot going on there, okay? You see the first half describes Emma Okay, it's really characteristic based, right? It says that she had very little that bothered her, okay, with in the first 21 years of her life, all right? And we see the word distress, and we see the word vex, okay? They're very similar. Vex means to annoy, all right? And then the second half, it goes into more of a characterization of her, right? She was the youngest of the two daughters of a most, a most affectionate, which means very, very loving father. You may not know what indulgent means, but indulgent means that he pretty much spoiled her. He gave her whatever she wanted, okay? And then um, in consequence means after her sister's marriage, uh, she was basically mistress of his house. So she was like the, the only person there basically. Uh, her mother had unfortunately died uh, long before. And so, the place of the mother was supplied by a governess who is like a nanny, who pretty much did a great job. She had fallen little short of a mother in affection, in her love for her, 
All right, so this, this governess must have been a really, really special person. So let's go take a look at the question. Which one summarizes it? Even though a character loses a parent at an early age, she is happily raised in a loving home. Okay, a couple of things that are true here, although it's a reversal of how we read it. The character does lose a parent. Okay, that's definitely true. Okay, um, at an early age, and she seems very happy. She had very little to bother her. So that's, that's probably the answer. This focus is on the affection of governess and how the affection of governess helped the girl overcome the loss of her mother, despite the indifference, which means a lack of care of the father. That's, that's definitely not, have, not the answer, All right? Largely as a result of her father's wealth and affection, a character leads a contented life. So is, it, is the entire summary about because she got so much from the father? I don't think so. I don't think that's the reason why she was so happy. And that's not the whole focus. Like we need the focus of this, which is the summary. So that's out. A character has a generally comfortable and fulfilling life, but then she must recover from losing her mother. This is the reverse of what happened though. Okay, the mother dies that when the girl is very young. So that's out. So A, a would be our answer, okay? Now, we're gonna look down at the next one and we notice that we have the evidence-based questions. So these are going to link, but I always look one ahead, all right? And I do see line 26 and I do see 28 and then 32. Well, what I know from doing this for as long as I have, if you take a look at those lines, one to 14, that pretty much eliminates one to five and nine to 14, okay? Um, the test doesn't like to go backwards. It moves chronologically. It doesn't like to repeat itself. That's just kind of a rule that the test follows pretty much all the time, okay? Now, that gives us 28 to 32, but it also gives us 26 over here. So I would actually do this one first, and then I would do these two, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at the word directed. Now, I'm not looking at the other words, okay? Don't look at them. They are wrong for all we know. Remember, there's a 75% chance that those answer choices are wrong. 75, okay? That's a really high percentage chance that it's wrong. So here's what I do. I underline it. I'm going to cross out most nearly because most nearly tells me that all the words could potentially be correct. And that can't possibly be right. I don't want to confuse myself any more than I have to. So directed means what? So I go over here, see the word directed. That's out over here. Okay, so I'm actually going to read this down and then focus here. And I'll show you how to do the problem as we go. Okay, so 16 years had Miss Taylor been in Mr. Woodhouse's family, less as a governess than a friend, very fond of both daughters, but particularly of Emma. Between them, it was more the intimacy of sisters. Even before Miss Taylor had ceased to hold the nominal office of governess, the mildness of her temper had hardly allowed her to impose any restraint. And the shadow of authority being now long passed away, they had been living together as friends and friends very mutually attached. And Emma doing just what she liked, highly esteeming Miss Taylor's judgment, but directed chiefly by her own. Now I'm going to go back to that line and I want to insert blank. My goal is to come up with my own word, okay? So come up with your own word and then we're gonna match that word to the answer choices. And whichever one matches, that's the answer, okay? Very important stuff. Here we go. Very mutually attached and Emma doing just what she liked. Highly esteeming Miss Taylor's judgment, but blanked chiefly by her own. I'm going to say a word like led chiefly by her own, okay? That's my word. Maybe you come up with a different one. Some, you know, some feeling sometimes we get, sometimes we can't figure out the words, but try to do that. Try to come up with your own word. So here we go back over here. My word is led, all right? And led chiefly by her own and trained chiefly by her own and aimed, guided, maybe, 
addressed. No, I'm going to go with guided. Now I go back and I, I plug it back in. Okay. So it's guided chiefly by her own. Highly esteeming Miss Taylor's judgment, but guided chiefly by her own. Yeah, I'm going to go with guided. That's what I'm going to do. So that one checks out. Okay. So I like that one. And now I have to go back and do these. All right. So I've narrowed it down to 28 to 32 and 32 to 34. Let's go take a look at that question and figure out exactly what the question is asking us to do. The narrator indicates that the particular nature of Emma's upbringing resulted in her being what? So we're looking for the results. So how is she now? Okay. So at 28 to 32, and 32 to 34. All right, it's done about here, and then here. All right, so that's C, and then D. Let's read. The real evils indeed of Emma's situation were the power of having rather too much her own way and a disposition to think a little too well of herself. These were the disadvantages which threatened alloy to her many enjoyments. The danger, however, was at present so unperceived that they did not by any means rank as misfortune with her. All right, so this is about the danger. My gut's telling me it's in this area. So let's go analyze that one more time. Remember, if I have a minute and 15 seconds per question and I have two of them, I have two minutes and 30 seconds to really figure this out. That's a long time. Okay, so that gives us a lot of time to figure this out. So we go slowly, figure it out, find what we're looking for. We have the evils of Emma's situation or the power of having rather too much her own way and a disposition to think a little too well of herself. These are the disadvantages. It's gotta be this right here disposition to think a little too well of herself. Let's go think, let's go see if there's anything that matches that. All right. I do think it's this. Despondent. You may not know what that means. All right. Let's just put a dash next to it just to leave it. Self-satisfied. She's satisfied with herself. Could that mean thinking a little too well of herself. She's like overly satisfied, self-satisfied, conceited. That, that's probably the answer. There's no indication that she's friendless. Now, is she inconsiderate? She has too, rather too much of her own way and a disposition to think a little too well of herself. But is she inconsiderate. I don't see anything that says that. So I'm not going to pick that. So now I'm stuck between despondent and self-satisfied. Now, if you have a strong vocabulary, all right, so despondent, you could figure out immediately. Um, but let's say you don't know. At that point, I do see self and satisfied and my reasoning is, could that mean that she's satisfied with herself, okay? Resulted in her being self-satisfied, almost like conceited. I'm kind of making an inference. Because I don't know what despondent means, but I, I'm kind of in the right ballpark, the word self, and it does match with thinking rather too highly of herself. I, I'm going to go with this one. Now, despondent means like, almost like unresponsive, you're so upset. Okay, but that's not it, but that, that definitely works. Um, and then this one works too. All right, so right away, we've knocked out two, three, four, and five. Okay, so watch out when we do the next one. Let's change up the color here. We have line 54, want means. All right, so 54. So we're gonna jump from 26, or really from 34 all, all the way to 50s. So Let's see what happens here. Now, typically I would probably read this on the real test just for context, but because this is a question that just asks for a vocabulary word, 
I would start up here probably. Like I, I might just skip this and go down and just read this. If I have to go back to read that, I will. But again, the test moves chronologically. So you probably don't have to worry about that. So here we go. The event had every promise of happiness for her friend. Mr. Weston was a man of unexceptionable character, easy fortune, suitable age, and pleasant manners. And there was some satisfaction in considering with what self-denying, generous friendship she had always wished and promoted the match. But it was a black morning's work for her. I guess she's black morning. She's probably like really depressed. That'd be my guess. The want of Miss Taylor would be felt every hour of every day. She recalled her past kindness, the kindness, the affection of 16 years, how she had taught and how she had played with her from five years old. I think she just misses her, right? The want of Miss Taylor, the blank of Miss Taylor, like the missing of her, right? She's not there and she's probably feeling really, really bad because this is like her best friend. Okay, so notice how I'm able to use the context to do this. For passages in the 1800s, you must do this, okay? Context is king. So I think this has to do something with missing. All right, here we go. Desire is not missing. Lack is missing. Requirement or request. I'm going to go with lack. And I want to plug it back in. the lack of Miss Taylor will be felt every hour. Yeah, that works. Desire doesn't work, okay? The desire of Miss Taylor, that's a different, that's definitely off topic, okay? That's definitely like a, like a romance novel. And this is not a romance novel. So that doesn't work, but uh, I think they sat around when they made this test and they said, hey, what, what would be like a funny answer? That's an eye catcher right there because I could tell you of, most students are going to pick that one right away. It just fits if you're not thinking in, you know, really deeply. The thing is, though, you don't have a desire of someone. You have a desire for someone. Okay, big difference. All right, so now we're almost done. Uh, oh, nice. We have one of these guys. If you remember, we're at 54, right? So I'm just getting rid of these guys. All right, I'm starting at 60 to 65 and then 73 to 79. So let's go mark that up. All right, we'll start like right around there. Bring it down just so I remember to read. Okay, definitely there's D. And what was it again? So I always want to check to make sure it's 60 to 65. So let's go all the way back up. It's right over here, a large, debt of gratitude was owing here, but the intercourse of the last seven years, the equal footing and perfect unreserve, which had soon followed Isabella's marriage on their being left to each other was yet a dearer, tenderer recollection. Okay, let's see. After Miss Taylor married. Okay. Does that match the idea of after she married? A debt of gratitude was owing here, the intercourse of the last seven years, equal footing and perfect and reserve, which had followed Isabella's marriage on her being left to each other was yet a dearer, tender recollection. So the answer would have to be something like she remembered her more, uh, but that's not, that's not there. So, and plus like if I'm making a simple inference, reasonably be inferred, what's the simplest idea that's next? Like, Miss Taylor got married, so she's not going to be living in the house anymore, I guess, and she won't see her as much. So that's what I would think. So let's go see if 73 to 79 to make sense. How was she to bear the change? It was true that her friend was going only half a mile from them, but Emma was aware that great must be the difference between a Mrs. Weston only half a mile from them and a Miss Taylor in the house. And with all her advantages, natural and domestic, she was now in great danger of suffering from intellectual solitude. Okay, that, nope. Fewer nope. interactions with Emma, that makes sense. Nope. No, 
So it's B and D. Okay, it absolutely has to be that. You know, she's out of the house, she's farther away. They're not gonna see each other as much. Okay, that's a reasonable inference. All right, now here's the last one. Which situation is most similar, is similar to the one described in lines 83 to 91? All right, so now you're just going to read 83 to 91. All right, the evil of the actual disparity in their ages and Mr. Woodhouse had not been married and not married early was much increased by his constitution and habits for having been a valetorian, oh, excuse me, I can't even read that word, wow. Valetutorian, tutorian, whatever, uh, whatever, right? It's a person in weak health who is overly concerned with his or her ailments. Now, why did they throw that word in there? Because it totally throws us off. It throws me off. That's not a word that I would ever use. And I have a pretty strong voc vocabulary. I'm having trouble even pronouncing it. So you just kind of skip over it. It's just a person in weak health who is overly concerned, so basically a hypochondriac. That would be the word that we would use. Right, it's hypochondriac all his life, without activity of mind or body. He was a much older man in ways than in years, and though everywhere beloved for the friendliness or beloved for the friendliness of his heart and his amiable temper, that's friendly temper, his talents could not have recommended him at any time. Okay, so I think the key is going to be this. Like, why else would they do that? Right. Why else would they give us a, an asterisk? So he's a hypochondriac. So we're dealing with um, basically the disparity of age. Okay, the topic sentence really does matter. Always look at topic sentences, right? All right, so let's see. Let's go over here. What is similar? It's some kind of disparity in age and dealing with something where he's kind of like a hypochondriac a little bit. He's worried about his health. All right, so mother and adult son have distinct tastes in art and music that result in repeated family arguments. I don't, I don't see how that's similar to, to this. Knowing that Emma's kind of young, I think that the adult son is a dead giveaway to be a wrong answer. All right, it's not the connection we want, not similar. The differences between an older and a younger friend are magnified because the younger one is more active and athletic. All right, well, you have older and younger, that works. It doesn't matter that they're friends. Uh, but then we have a younger one is more active and athletic. So when I look at that, let me see. For having been without activity, without activity of mind or body, he was much older man in ways than in years. And though everywhere beloved for his friendliness. Okay, so I think that's that's probably the answer because we're dealing with the age that works there. And I think that that works a little better. The like active and athletic is basically like, it's the opposite of what the father is and what Emma would be. So that's probably the answer. An older and a younger scientist remain close friends despite the fact that the older one's work is published more frequently. Mm -hmm. No, that doesn't make sense. The age difference between a high school student and a college student becomes a problem even though they enjoy the same diversions. Uh, these are still too similar being students. That answer has to be B. It's an older person and a younger person. That definitely is a, the most similar. All right, and now we have one more. Let's head back over here. Main purpose is literally what happened. Okay, so what happens? What happens? Does this describe a main character and a significant change in her life? You have Emma and her friend moves away. That's a pretty significant change. That's probably the answer. Provide an overview of a family and a nearby neighbor. It's not really an overview of a family. I, that's not it. You would have more depth about the actual family. Discuss some regrettable personality flaws in a main character. No. Explain the relationship between a main character and her father. It does not do that. It doesn't, doesn't explain the relationship. It mentions it, but it doesn't explain it. I'm going with A. All right, so as you can see, I'm able to answer everything 
focusing on answering questions as opposed to focusing on reading. Not only will this make this easier for you, but it will um, it'll save you a lot of time, and a lot of energy. I mean, let's face it, energy is so important here. You have so many questions to answer and so many sections to work on. You don't want to burn out on the first part. All right, so I hope that helped. If you have any questions, you know how to reach me. All right, thanks.